I know what you're thinking. Another one on neoconservative? And yeah, someone asked me about this on Twitter, and like, I just got home from work, and for some reason, I felt like doing this more than the other videos I had planned. Plus, this should be short, as well as there was comments in the other video claiming it was debunking a position no one really had, which is wrong, but anyway, this allows me to look at the claims made by someone directly. Also, I'm really only looking at the bit on neoconservatism. I don't care, nor is this my area of study, so I make no claims with the regarding the accuracy of other portions of Cynical Historian's videos. And I also just don't care enough to go over the whole thing. So for about 10 minutes to 12 minutes is the part I'm responding to, and I'll show it here. The new left faltered in these troubled times, and a significant opposition arose to fight them, called neoconservatism. It formed in response to the counterculture. Interestingly enough, a lot of the neoconservative intellectual leadership either came from the new left or the old left. They really got their start as Trotskyists, arguing with Stalinists at New York City College. People like Irving Kristol and Daniel Bell drifted from the left during the ferment of the 1960s, creating a conservative journal in 1965 called The Public Interest. Then there was Norman Poderitz, who steadily brought the Commentary magazine further to the right as he transitioned from anti-Stalinist Marxism to neoconservatism. He lists Daniel Bell, Irving Kristol, and Norman Poderitz. Uh, now, he never directly calls Poderitz Trotsky as just an anti-Stalinist Marxist. I want to quote the main paragraph that I'm taking an issue with. A lot of the neoconservative leadership came from the new left or the old left. They really got their start as Trotskyists arguing with Stalinists at New York City College. People like Irving Kristol and Daniel Bell drifted from the left during the ferment of the 1960s. Now, if you've already seen my video, The Myth of the Trotskyist and Neoconservative Pipeline, you probably already know what I'm going to say. So, first, let's take a look at the names he listed. Irving Kristol, from Irving Kristol himself. I was a young Trotskyist for 18 months or so, but even when I was in it, I really couldn't quite take it seriously. Irving Kristol never joined the Socialist Workers' Party, as far as I have ever been able to dig up. He joined the Workers' Party, which was led by Max Chapman. But at that point, Trotsky was claiming if Chapman was a Trotskyist, then he was opposed to Trotskyism. As well, of the Workers' Party, Kristol's was a part of the Shermanite faction, which was thrown out in 1941 for rejecting Marxism. Crystal, by the end of World War II, could also not be called a leftist, let alone claiming he drifted from it in the 1960s. He had been a liberal for decades by then. Now, on to Daniel Bell. Bell also never joined the Trotskyist party. He was a, a member of the YPSL when a bunch of Trotskyists joined. However, he became a member of the Social Democratic Federation and in 1939 wrote, Trotskyism as a derivative of Leninism is alien to freedom of thought and conscious and must be fought. Bell was never a Trotskyist and hated it in the 30s. And, finally, Norman Poderitz. Poderitz literally was never a Marxist. He was a liberal, and he went to Columbia College in 1946. And now on to a little bit. What is neoconservatism? Now, I'm not going to go over my whole video again. Go watch my Myth of the Trotskyist and Neocon Pipeline video in full for more of an explanation. But the main thing that makes neocons neo is their support for major social programs. To quote Nathan Glazer, a neocon view on what made them separate. All of us had voted for Lyndon Johnson in 1964 and Hubert Humphrey in 1968 and continued to vote for Democratic presidential candidates all the way to the present. Had we not defended the major social programs from Social Security to Medicare, there would have been no need for neo before conservatism. So, these, as I said in my uh, neocon video, these were Cold War liberals, and what changed them from traditional conservatives was not their foreign policy, but their position on domestic policy. Well, that is it. I'm going to break from my typical convention of publishing a script with full citations for all claims because, well, none of this is new information. And if you want to know where I got it, you, this is really just sort of a preview of the information that's in my Trot to Neocon Pipeline video. And the script for that is on my website if you don't want to watch the video. And you can watch the video on YouTube and on PeerTube. And just to give a preview of my next planned videos, in no particular order, I plan to do one on the first Soviet government, the left art, and Bolshevik coalition and kind of go over their positions contrasting and comparing uh, them while they were in government together. Um, I'm also going to start my series on the 30 Soviet famine, also called the Holodomor, and I'm going to start covering with the peasant slaughter of animals. See, rather than do a full, like, multi-hour video on it, I'm really going to go over a lot of the specific claims people make as to the cause and explain why, you know, they're wrong. The peasants butchering animals didn't cause it, and neither did the weather. 
Uh, there will also be uh, Bukhara in part two. And as well, what will probably be the video that comes out first out of this set. And it is titled, Why You Won't Have a Clothes Dryer Under Communism. Which is a little less about clothes dryers specifically and more for a chance to talk about my view on technology, the left, and its relation to climate change. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this short video.